these patients have SDH intact. And then the rest are patients that are SDH deficient. And then what it does is it tells you where, it tells you a lot of things, but one of the things it also tells you is that some patients have a mutation in the SDH gene, either SDH A, B, C, or D subunits, and these patients out here actually don't have that. They don't have SDH, they're still SDH deficient, they don't have a mutation in the SDH gene, but they have what's called a hypermethylation phenotype. So I think that this, this is actually, um, I think this slide really highlights the value of collaboration between the patient community and the provider community to really gain information in a rare subtype of GIST because it was really through the collaboration of creating the NCI pediatric GIST clinic that we were able to learn this much about this very rare subtype of disease. And it's also helped us to understand now that in this population of patients with SDH deficient GIST, we have to start thinking, how do we think novelly about strategies to treat this disease which has a different driver than it may be GIST? So what else have we learned about SDH deficient GIST? It clearly dominates the GISTs that are diagnosed in patients under the age of 20. And this slide basically summarizes patients who had their pathology reviewed and it's called the AFIP, which um, actually doesn't exist anymore, but it was a, a, a reference lab um, at the NCI. And um, the patients, the red bar, are patients that are SDH deficient or SDH negative, and the blue bar are people that were SDH positive, meaning the majority of those patients have an activating kit mutation. And as you can see, in people under the age of 20, the majority are SDH deficient. And as you get older, you see the majority of cases are SDH intact. It's also important to know that there are adults that have SDH deficient GIST. And that's these small, these small red bars at the top of each, the small red sections at the top of each bar. And I think, you know, whether that is patients who may have actually had their disease, for decades before and just doesn't become diagnosed until the adult age range or whether they initiate in the adult age range, I think we don't completely understand. But it is important to know that this is a population that can occur across the age spectrum. So this patient had SDH deficient GIST and what did we learn over the next decade <coughs> of care? We learned that the patient had a family history of GIST, a parent was diagnosed with GIST under the age of 40. We learned that they were as the tumor was SDH B negative and therefore characterized as an SDH deficient GIST. And then because of the family history and what we've learned from the NCI pediatric um, clinic as well as other groups that have been focused on this is that we learned that the patient was found to have a germline, a germline SDH A mutation. So what does that mean? That means that the mutation wasn't just abnormal, the gene wasn't just abnormal in the tumor, but the gene was also abnormal in all the cells of her body. Um, we also learned that that was present in a parent as well, and therefore it was uh, passed on from the, the parent um, to the, the daughter. The patient remained on sunitinib for five years. Imaging was completely stable, and generally the patient tolerated things well. However, after about six years, what happened was the patient actually developed diffuse swelling, uh, very significant lower body swelling. So we went on a hunt to try to figure out why that happened. And um, we know that with long-term use, in a small subset of patients, these drugs can cause different toxicities. And in this particular patient, what we found was that it had caused a cardiomyopathy or some weakening of her heart muscle. And what that did was tell us that it was time to stop the treatment of sumitinib. Um, I think it's really important to note that two years later, what we learned was that the cardiomyopathy had resolved, and that can happen with um, cardiac toxicity from these agents can be reversible in some patients. Um, actually, in the few number of patients that I've had that have had it, it can reverse. It's very important that if there are any concerns over cardiovascular risk or toxicity, that there's a collaboration between the oncologist and we have a, a cardiology service that's particularly interested in the cardiac toxicities of cancer. Um, and this particular patient was managed jointly with cardiology and oncology. Cardiomyopathy, heart function normalized. And two years off treatment, the GIST never progressed, remained completely stable. 
And I think that's also an important factor when one thinks about treatment initiation in SDH deficient disease and balancing of risks and benefits of treatment. Because SDH deficient just in some people at some periods of time can have a very indolent course, meaning it doesn't change a lot. It can just stay stable. And this was a case of that where the disease was stable for measured in years off of all treatment. So then the issue becomes, and I don't think this sort of finishes up my, my case, is well then what would we do if it did start to progress? And I'll ask my colleagues, what would you do next if, the, if it started to progress again? Because now she's off treatment. So and her cardiomyopathy was resolved. Resolved, um, So if it started to progress, I mean the um, issue with SD, deficient gist is that there's no many available treatments so far. Um, so I don't know if um, we could potentially re-challenge her with sunitinib or try regorapamide that has some activity to it. Yes. And um, I agree. I mean, I think that the what we've learned over time is that um, the kinase inhibitors that we have that are approved for gist um, beyond imatinib, so sunitinib and regorafenib, and also pazopinib, which is not approved, but has been used in phase two trials both in the US and in Europe, um, clearly have activity <coughs> against SDH deficient gist. Exactly why, we don't completely understand. They tend to hit not just KIT, which is the driver mutation in most adult gist, but they also hit a lot of the factors in, um, in the VEGF system. Uh, which is sort of the angiogenesis system, and there's some data to suggest that that might be an important system in SDH deficient disease. So either rechallenge or sunitinib could be considered because the patient never progressed on sunitinib, and that again would be under close collaboration with cardiology. Use of regorafenib, which is commercially approved and has demonstrated um, uh, an objective response, meaning has demonstrated tumor shrinkage in patients with this disease, um, or consideration of pisopinib. Important to note though, when you re when we consider rechallenge of a drug in a patient that has had a prior toxicity to that drug or something similar, again, very important close collaboration to ensure that you're watching things very closely to try to minimize that risk of collaborate of um, recurrent toxicity. And then lastly, always we want to consider clinical trials, and this is a, a um, a trial that has been open and is ongoing at the NCI, um, looking at a methyltransferase inhibitor in patients with a number of different diseases that are characterized by SDH deficiency. Um, and what's really interesting about this trial is that it's really getting, from a mechanistic perspective, is that we're trying to impact the disease um, through one of the biologic findings that we think characterize the disease, which is this hypermethylation um, phenotype, which is seen in patients with SDH abnormalities. So that's it for my case, and I'm going to switch it over. Oh, I'm going to switch it over to Baya, and um, at the end of the cases, we'll be available to ask questions, answer questions.